Welcome to BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT. Uh, my name is Brian Runciman. We've got an excellent panel today. We're going to look at some really positive and upbeat stuff that you can do uh, from the comfort or, or otherwise of your own home. Just going to start off, um, uh, just introduce our um, panelists. So you can see from the introductory slide there, we've got Matt Howarth. Uh, Matt's a, a social entrepreneur, uh, is that Reason Digital? Hello, Matt. Um, we've got uh, Ian Hughes, um, he, he's Hello. a senior analyst of the Internet of Things 451. It's on our a gaming SG. And we've got Nick Lambert, who's uh, an expert on digital Hi. arts and uh, is also on one of our SGs. So uh, just the, the next slide, we just want to do a little advert before we start. Uh, although it's not changed, here we go. Uh, BCS Vital workers campaign but we're just um very keen on uh, getting those people that are in the it profession that are really contributing at these difficult times to be uh, lauded or at least mentioned have a shout out for the stuff they're doing uh, so use that uh, hashtag we've had quite a few hundreds of nominees so far of people that are going above and beyond in unusual times so uh, we'd uh, just like you to do that so i'm, I'm just going to um stop sharing my screen now uh, so that uh, we can just talk as as a group of people. So hopefully that will be four happy looking faces on the screen. <laughs> if it's not something you're going. Um, <laughs> so um, gentlemen, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of go around. Um, we've obviously got a little bit more used to working from home now. So really what we want to talk about today is the, the more creative and social things uh, that we should be doing and being engaged with. You've, you've got three different clear perspectives on this. So if we can start, Ian, from the gaming perspective, um, show, us your, show us your little mask you had um, what we were just planning before. <laughs> oh, I, that, that was less of a mask and more of a... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, VR, VR headset. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the sort of thing we could be doing. So Ian, tell us a little bit about the stuff that's exciting you at the moment. Okay, well, there, there's some stuff that, that's, that's reignited. Um, my excitement, which has been just the use of virtual worlds for us to communicate with one another, whether it's in whether it's in virtual reality or on the screen or on the phone or on a console. And you may, some of you may remember back in 2006, two, well, 2006, 2009, a, a massive influx of interest in Second Life, which is one of the many virtual worlds. And this is a use generated content place that you turn up with your avatar, and engage with other people in in whatever subject you you care to meet and talk about so it can be from social it can be business stuff and that's very much having a renaissance and i got to re-meet with some people that i knew from a very long while ago back in 2006 um in a business that they're restarting up in second life and having been in lockdown for 60 odd days um going to that venue talking to those people sat around a campfire albeit various shapes of avatars and interesting things going on um after it finished i really truly felt i'd been somewhere and i've, I've felt that before in right. virtual environments but but there was a probably the, the counterpoint of the the lockdown and and the the kind of burnout that we have from these kind of i mean i know we're doing video here but the, the all the video chats we do the the peace and tranquility of being able to communicate with people in an avatar um, moderated environment was utterly fantastic and uh, yeah quite moving in a good way okay. as well yeah yeah and and on on top of that we've had um, obviously there's a lot more online gaming going on and some of the the biggest online game franchises but like Fortnite, have stopped or enhance what they do so they're not just a battle royale where you pile in and shoot all your mates which is or strangers which is good fun and my kids play that a lot but they've they've started to create um entertainment venues and entertainment experiences so they had travis scott's big rap it's like being in a giant rap video but virtually with all these other other avatars running around kind of in it and now they've created their party royale island where they ran a um a dj set for everyone to turn up so you, you, you're turning up to an event at a time with other people and uh, my son to his credit is 14 stayed up till one o'clock in the morning to go to that particular event and then felt guilty about telling me about it 
because he thought he'd done something bad, <laughs> which is a good thing <laughs> because that's that's part of it. You know, it's a relatively safe teenage experience, I would suggest. So, and, yes. and they're all enabled by by games technology, but then so they're not necessarily games, and mm -hmm. and being able to separate the two. Sometimes you do want to play. Sometimes you just want to hang out. Sometimes you want to do business and they can all be mediated in, in these kind of spaces and will continue to be because I love all the video conference stuff to some degree, but it's, it's not the same as no. actually going somewhere and virtually yeah. the same as going somewhere. Yeah. Lovely. That's interesting. Thank you. Now, Matt, let's come to you. You've got a, a different perspective on these kind of things that we can engage with now and enrich our, our lives with. Uh, tell us a little bit about your approach at the moment. What's, what's exciting you? Well, really, um, you know, time and time again, when we look at um, studies about what uh, positively impacts people's mental health, we see that uh, acts of kindness, uh, service to others, a sense of purpose, uh, often top the rankings of those things. Uh, and actually, this lockdown has, has made it harder for us to, to, to get some of those factors. You know, it's a uh, it might be uh, that the common kindnesses that we're doing for our friends or people around us, something as simple as opening a door or, or helping somebody on a train with a, with a heavy bag are things that we're not getting to do right now. So uh, what's been really interesting to me is how tech is adapting to that and just the absolute um, uh, tsunami of people who are willing to sign up to these platforms uh, and, and put their hand up and say that, you know, I'm willing to help from home or in some cases, mm -hmm. I'm willing to uh, for you to call on me to to come out of my home at the personal risk to myself in order to help people in my community. So that's what's been really inspiring me right now. Excellent. Uh, Nick, your perspective is different again. You're on the digital arts. I see some interesting bits on you all behind you. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what's happening with you. <laughs> Certainly. Well, I think it's interesting that Ian refers to um, the sort of re I suppose the rediscovery of, of the virtual space online in a, in a sort of different sense than our sort of Zoom and uh, other other flat sort of video media. I mean, this is the way, for, certainly, you know, there's, there's a number of different responses, but I mean, one that's interesting to me is the way that uh, galleries and museums are having to move so much of what they do online. But there's an experiential mm -hmm. element there, which is very hard to actually get unless you're inside the place itself. So obviously the ideal, sort of ideal halfway house is to actually position yourself in a virtual gallery space. And what's interesting is the range of different ways that's being achieved at the moment. Uh, for instance, there's a company called V21 Art Space who've been doing a lot of virtual tours of various places. I mean, one of my favourite ones is actually the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, which is a wonderful collection of all manner oh, of, that's great. Uh, sort yeah. of uh, you know sort of artefacts from the whole world. Um, and the V21 um, sort of walkthrough, albeit achieved, I think, using slightly older technology with QuickTime, perhaps more so than with um, sort of contemporary uh, gaming platforms, but that's the obvious next step. And other galleries have taken that sort of biggest, biggest step as well. So I think trying to sort of bridge that, I mean, people obviously have now got the time to explore these places a lot more from, from home. And it's notable quite a number of newspapers. I've seen it in Forbes, I've seen it in The Guardian, several others have been sort of promoting these uh, virtual mm -hmm. galleries. Uh, one sort of obvious uh, place to find them as well is uh, Google Arts and Culture, because of course Google have done a lot to digitize museum collections as well. So there's, you know, there are opportunities there to start exploring, but then also I think um, more from sort of our digital art end is, is, is a sort of opportunity for digital artists to get in there and sort of start using online platforms, um, you know, sort of put, push, their, push their, their work forward even more. So I, I may, may refer to some of the things that the Computer Art Society has been doing. I mean, not only a series of quite successful online talks that have taken the place of the meetings that we were having physically in, in the BCS HQ in London, which have actually garnered a lot, a lot more viewers because, of course, people can now start coming to them. So I think we're finding that, you know, outreach to audiences, potential to grow there, how you sort of position yourself inside spaces that you can't actually access at the moment is, is another one. And uh, then, of course, you know, sort of potential for collaborative creativity as well. I mean, I think this is the other things. I mean, not so much, perhaps, not, not only from the visual arts side, but also from the musical side, especially. We're seeing lots of musicians being forced to sort of work remotely. And mm. uh, sort of um, just I've got a bit of a background in choral singing. So choirs are one thing that's taken a very big hit during this, this crisis because you simply can't meet to rehearse or anything. But the range of possibilities now for meeting online, trying to rehearse online, etc. There's a whole sort of raft of creative solutions, I think, to this isolation problem. 
Mm, that's excellent. Thank you. Very interesting. So on that uh, sort of working working together, Ian, how, how is that working for you? Um, actually, tell us a little bit more about the Second Life stuff. One of the things that, that uh, Matt mentioned was the, the mental health side of things. So that, that interaction, doing stuff together, becomes more important, doesn't it? How do you feel that works in, in Second Life? Because I think most people, sorry to make this a long question, but <laughs> I was just thinking, but a lot of people remember what I do, which is in 2006, 2007, lots of corporations bought big chunks of Second Life because it was going to be a new platform for conferences, which never really transpired, did it? So how is it evolving now to sort of support that interaction? Um, well, I mean, there's, there are other other platforms exist. I have to say that as well. I mean, I have a, yes. a specific yeah. interest in, in Second Life, but the, um, the, the things that we needed to do and wanted to do haven't gone away. So what went away was the interest in it because we we kind of in, in sort of two thousand eight nine that that was when social media was kind of kicking off, and so mm -hmm. people that hadn't really engaged in online stuff before, so they weren't necessarily bloggers or anything like that, suddenly had a an outlet, and it's a relatively simple outlet, and you know you don't you type in text and chuck in photos around, and that that kind of took everyone and so now we're living in a world where lots of people understand social media maybe not understand what what the hell's going on sometimes but understand social media and and the willingness to interact online they've now also been forced into interacting online more both with friends and family and with work and so that means that the the drivers for people trying something else like being able to be in an avatar moderated space there's, there's lots of other ways of doing it but having those things to say can we gather around our data can we have a memorable even business meeting a, a memorable mm. meeting because it happened somewhere and you knew who you were sat next to mm. those things are still very important to us and i think the more that people are experiencing um, kind of video fatigue and the fact that doing doing meeting after meeting after meeting when you're finished you're still sat in the same office you can't remember anything that's happened and you weren't mm. you were watching videos bounce around the screen because they never quite stay in the same place if you have i mean here's okay we've just got four of us but you have a 10 person meeting things are flicking yeah. all over the place and that doesn't happen in the physical world and it also whilst it can but doesn't need to happen in the virtual world you place yourself you express yourself in where you where you placed yourself, what you look like, where you are, where you sat, who you sat next to, or who you stood next to, or who you're flying next to. It doesn't really matter. But then once you've completed whatever that task is, whether it's catching up with friends or whether it's a business meeting, you have a mental bookmark of, yes, I was there. And there are meetings yeah. back from 2006 yeah. Yeah. that I remember distinctly. And I remember the conversations just the same as I remember some of them at conferences and some of them at some places, you know, entertainment venues, they all blur into one. But compared to the, the you know, the past couple of months worth of, um, of video calls, most of them, I mean, I've got notes and I've got PowerPoints, but I, I can't yeah. recall who said what when. That's very interesting. So that, Do you use your that. headset then, then? Do you use your headset in, in, in those circumstances then so that you're in that? 3D environment. Well, for Second Life, no. I mean, it it you, it can be done, but there are emerging platforms that are around using the headset. Mm. So, um, say so there's lots of platforms available, but Spatial recently went to a a kind of free model. They were they were originally based solely around doing augmented reality and using the very the very good but very expensive Microsoft Hololens headset, which oh, yeah. mm -hmm. keeps the, the physical world in your view and puts digital stuff in it rather than VR, mm. which completely replaces it. Mm. They've now switched to say it'll work in VR, so it'll work on the Oculus Quest, the standalone, mm. relatively cheap headset. And so I've now got that on my Quest, and I can have a have a VR meeting with somebody who's on a regular screen or who's in AR, so that the blending of these these environments so that depending on what kit you're using you get certain affordances about how you might interact but at least in just what i'm doing here in vr i can wave my arms around and point at stuff and move yes and so so that that's this ability to take who we are as humans and communicate what we need to say not just filter it because of the 
all the thing the only thing that the technology can do is filter it for our own convenience trying to get mm. more of us into this stuff it includes emotion and it includes mm. expressiveness and they're things that we quite often lose when we try to go all businessy yeah people think so, that they uh, should wear a suit and stare at the screen like this yes <laughs> so, so Matt, just thinking about that, that emotion side of things um trying to sort of engage in social change what sort of benefits have you seen from people being able to interact at the moment in, in the ways that they do are there any new things you're seeing emerge in the way people try and assist each other in this space yeah, and, and that's on a number of levels. I think one interesting thing about um, the, the opportunities that's being posed by this uh, is around how uh, charitable services and the charitable sector is adapting. So um, the, there's obviously, you know, face-to-face -face contact is the gold standard for, for some of the work that those charities do, things like counselling and, and, and support, supporting people through very difficult times. That said, there are benefits to, to, to doing things digitally. It's not just about the drawbacks, it's about the possibilities as well. I think mm -hmm. we're, we're all a little bit in the kind of drawback frame of mind right now because we're just sort of dealing with, with what's going on. But actually, you know, if you're, um, if you're a single mother that struggles to get out of the house, if you're agoraphobic and struggles to get out of the house, you know, actually these, these new services being available to you digitally are opening uh, up for you for the first time. Uh, and, and actually increasing the accessibility of some of these services to new audiences, I think is a really interesting side effect of what's going on. At an individual level, I think there's also many more opportunities for, for people to help. And, you know, there'll be a number of um, IT practitioners listening to this who I think, you know, might be wondering what they can do. Mm. Um, I, I think there's two ways in which they can help. One is as a, one is as a, a, a human being um, and there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of platforms out there that are helping connect you to uh, opportunities to help. Uh, Facebook's COVID Information Centre, Nextdoor's Help Map, um, you, 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 a, a two to mention, uh, mm. ensuring that you're following what's going on in your community. There's been an absolute upsurge in mutual aid groups, which are small, yeah. self-organised groups within local communities, and often they need um, they need they, they need practical support. Uh, mm. There's also ways to leverage your IT skills as well to to, to help. So um, I know that the BCS has a great um, volunteering portal, for example, which is a good place to start mm. if you're thinking about volunteering your professional skills. Uh, and there's also some slightly more fun ways to do it as well. So um, uh, Macmillan, for example, is one charity we work with at Reason Digital. They have uh, a Game Heroes campaign where people who are interested in, in video games can do fundraising marathons to raise money for that charity. Um, and you might think, okay, well, that's, that's, that's a bit of silly fun. The, the fact is that these charities are now absolutely depending on people uh, mm -hmm. to find creative ways to continue to fundraise on their behalf from their home, given the massive drop in income that they've seen from events like the London Marathon being canceled and other in-person uh, sponsorship events. So actually, you know, you're doing a great thing if you can engage with some of those things as well. Well, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, good points. Uh, so, uh, Nick, um, on the um, the art side of things, how, how have um, artists been able to engage with their communities? Because obviously that's changing, isn't it? Certainly. Well, I think, you know, to come back to what Ian was saying briefly, I mean, we've, we've got perhaps more mature hardware and software in this area of, of you know, virtu virtual reality, but also don't forget artists have been working in this area for some time. I mean, uh, two that I know of, uh, Ruth Gibson and Bruno Martelli, for instance, have been doing a lot of work in VR over the last 20 years, but they've recently done, with, as a collaboration with several other artists, um, a piece called You're in, the, in, in a Computer Game, Max, which is actually um, skelf.org.uk is hosting that. And the intention of that piece is to actually take you out of the sort of typical gallery space into a virtual space in which you can move around and interact with works that are actually inside us, you know, in, inside a, a sort of quasi real space. I mean, that's one sort of interesting example. I mean, at a sort of another scale, uh, the, uh, the, the gallery Hauser and Worth have actually invested now in a whole new art lab. With, with the intention of creating sort of more VR experiences and some sort of VR pre previews online, et cetera, of work that they're doing. And I think this is, you know, indicative that it's um, sort of all, all different levels where um, artists, gallerists, and indeed the sort of major art exhibitions, for instance, Art ba Basel, for instance, there, um, you know, they were hit by COVID as soon as, um, as, you know, in March when they were supposed to have um, a very large, um, uh, you know, a, a very large sale in Hong Kong. They've moved all of that online to their online viewing rooms. And in fact, they said that was the 
the first and the largest of the uh, online sales that they've done. But um, uh, the scale of that, something like 235 galleries were participating in that um, in that alone. So mm. there's a, you know, I think throughout the art world, there's a recognition that you can move many things online and also given the maturity of some of the tech or the growing maturity of some of the tech, it is possible now to offer things. But, you know, I think digital artists in particular are keen not merely to represent things that were done previously in, in physical settings, but rather to take advantage of the, the, the digital medium as well. I mean, there's much that you can do once you're virtual. Again, as, as Ian said, the sort of uh, potentials for avatars, the potentials for, you know, sort of recreating worlds around you. I mean, that's um, been explored at length and um, Two, two of our collaborators in, in the Computer Art Society are uh, Genetic Moo, uh, Nicole Schauman mm -hmm. and Tim Pickham. Mm -hmm. and last night they were doing, um, as part of our um, sort of series of, of artists' talks, they were actually doing a live presentation from their place in Margate with um, essentially creating a cave in their front room using sort of projectors, using uh, a curved mirror, but also then several different webcams, all, all actually broadcasting on Zoom, and they were pushing the, the limits of what Zoom could do, certainly, but there was live interaction, live feedback coming, and mm. um, we're going to have another session on Saturday. So, I mean, that there is that potential, I think, for audience reaching out and uh, wor working closely with your, uh, you know, with, with, with the viewers in, in ways that weren't sort of perhaps as as doable in, in, in sort of uh, physical settings. So I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's, there's ways we can turn this around positively. Yeah, lovely. Um, now, um, I should have mentioned, because uh, we've already had a question come in, uh, that uh, attendees can Which use all the questions to have. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on. Go on in. And I was just going to say, I was just following on from, following on from what Nick was saying. Mm. The, um, the use of, uh, I mean, all, all the VR headsets have some wonderful kind of creative tools in them that aren't aren't for anything else other than than painting and modelling. And so, because it's very very tactile and it's it's using your hands and moving some stuff, it's people are being able to go straight into building think 3D models and building 3D scenes in things like Quill and and Medium and stuff like that. And and those then are, are very easy to then distribute and for other people to see and engage with so you can you can just be a consumer of it or you can be a yeah. creator of it or you can take what they've done and then modify it further and one of the one of the lovely things about a lot of them is that you can watch it be being built so it's yeah. not just here's the end result it's here's the the time period and the strokes that were made to to cause this thing and that that level of um engagement with the with the person with the art in kind of in your own time as well. I mean, you, you could be at a live event and they do do kind of live VR paint brushing things, but but it's that that fitting into your schedule because I say time's gone really weird for everyone, isn't it? But it's <laughs> it's it's just at the right time. And just I've just remembered the other day I, I downloaded a um, a VR pottery application hmm. stroke game, and I spent an hour shaping clay with my hand and baking it and then decorating it different pots different shapes and um i was live streaming it on facebook because it's a weird thing to be doing because i'm normally shooting things i guess but or, or driving cars but um now when i i was in the kitchen looking at our little garlic pot and i was looking at how it had been built my brain had gone oh how would i uh, how would i do that in my clay application now I haven't got mm. time to set up a, a, a wheel and get clay and all that sort of stuff, and I probably get fed up really quickly. But it was utterly relaxing and has changed my perception of the world. Yeah, that's very interesting. Now, um, so that leads on to, to, to the question that's come in. I was just going to say to the audience, if you use the questions, there's a little panel on um, GoToWebinar called Questions. You can put questions in. So here's one we had: Should we be seduced or driven to achieve polish? Um, the PlayStation 5 looks awesome. This webinar could be in 4K, HD. Mm. But what wins? Graphical slickness, stories, connections, or immersion? Stories. Ian, let's, let's stay with you, Ian. Narrative. All, everything mm. is always about narrative. And, and how that gets expressed, sometimes you need the high-end stuff. Sometimes you just need a little box that's bouncing around, just as we see with mm. animation, regular film animation. Or just words. So just words. I've written a couple the novels they're things that people can read and picture in their head the the quest for ultimate 100 percent realism is a good one 
because as I say there are times you need it but that's not the thing that you need to be worrying about and, and there's n there's almost no way an individual wanting to create something in the, in a game space is going to end up creating something that uh, 300 people that have been doing it for years are going to do it as a team uh, but mm. the tooling is getting better and and so to be able to borrow some of their stuff and put some things together you, you you've got every option under the sun if you want to if you want to do 2d black and white stuff do it if you want to try and do high-end 3d rendering give it a go and, mm. but that's it's not it's not the only goal Definitely. I wonder, yeah. I wonder, wonder, Matt, if you might have a different view on that, because you know, when you're trying to help somebody in a virtual space, perhaps to to learn how to use an app, and you have to do it remotely, you need a certain level of um, of <laughs> rendering, don't you, to to make that work? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. Um, human connection can um, transmit through even the most kind of low bandwidth things. You know, we 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 all regularly interact with and 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 have a laugh with our friends over text messages. I'm sure, you know. So from from, from from my perspective, I think it's interesting in thinking about how the medium is is more suitable for for what's going on, and we've seen, um, you know, maybe the rush to replicate real life uh, virtually isn't it, it is almost a missed opportunity sometimes to to do something that's um, different to real life or better than real life. Um, uh, one of the um, you know, Nick mentioned that uh, choirs are particularly suffering right now. Um, another group that's particularly suffering right now is um, is your uh, drug and alcohol recovery groups. Who you know have a have a weekly kind of cadence of meetings that they meet face to face privately and uh, and get that mutual support. You know some organisations have, have rushed to convert those into Zoom calls uh, that happen at the same time every week. But actually, uh, those groups that have experimented with things like just putting people in a text messaging group um, have actually found really good results as well. And actually, maybe mm. because you can never really replicate the benefit of face to face, imitating it. It misses the mark and actually stepping back and rethinking what the medium could be could be a better approach. Interesting. Definitely. And then, Nick, from your point of view, uh, are artists a bit more precious about the the, the quality of of, of of the uh, of the image, or uh, obviously there's things like glitch, aren't there, which uh, take advantage? Oh, yes. I mean, there's, but... there's, you know, there's there's this burgeoning area of pixel art. There's there's glitch art. There's uh, you know, I think there's a number of different ways of achieving immersion. And I think what Matt was saying about those groups is absolutely correct. I mean, immersion can take so many different forms, and it it often it, it depends on your own ability to influence or change things in the sort of air in the sort of experience that you're having so it might be great if you sit back and just consume a very highly rendered piece of uh, you know sort of film for instance or you know that but that's a, a kind of linear experience whereas if you had a, a fairly basic but also engaging um, interactive experience which you know many artists aim to achieve I think that can also have a much uh, uh, better effect as well mm -hmm. I mean uh, you know if, if you look at some of the uh, for, for instance the uh, the Serpentine Gallery at the moment has done a series of different uh, digital commissions and um, some of the very uh, rather interesting but there's one called I Magma which is uh, by the artist Yena Sutela, which is um, is basically a machine oracle. It just delivers live readings and sort of daily divinations, but it's done in a sort of uh, an, in, an interesting setting that indeed makes you sort of rather immersed in in, in, the, in that sort of approach. But there's, yeah, I think there's lots of ways to achieve immersion, um, you know, and artists are often keen to hack together something which is actually oftentimes using tools in ways that were never intended. Mm, interesting. Now, while, while we're talking to you, Nick, um, I was just wondering if, what the role of cur curation might be at the moment in these things. I, I just read a, an article on the on the Quietus yesterday, I think it was, where Brett Anderson, the the ex suede or current suede uh, singer, sort of curated twelve paintings or ten paintings that you can go and see virtually at the moment. Uh, with the amount of stuff out there, that seems like an interesting approach. Is there a lot of curation going on? Oh, certainly. I mean, I think as as a, an outcome of some of these galleries going online anyway, they not only sort of produce their own uh, digital shows. I mean, I mentioned that uh, Google Arts and Culture just got together every Vermeer painting um, in, a, in a way that you just couldn't do physically. They put them all into one virtual space so you can see them all next to each other. You, you couldn't do that in the real world in all the galleries in which they're separated. Mm. But I think, mm. for, yes, on a personal level, I think more curation is, is, is certainly possible and several several curators are doing just that, actually, either either in sort of live 3D or 
merely just sort of putting different things on a page and pulling them together. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the term curation has been stretched over the years, I think, you know, to um, see us, you know, sort of either as a profession where a professional curator goes in and makes something of a, you know, a, a series of images, or whether you see it as an activity that many people could join in and you can have sort of a, a large, large numbers voting or even inserting their own curated works into a much bigger space, which is, is another possibility. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You've, you've just yeah, reminded me. We... <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. I've talked over you again, Brian. Sorry, Go on. Go on. It's all right. <laughs> well, no, no, it, particularly the 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 um, classic works of art um, angle that that's emerged in Animal Crossing. Now, if you haven't come across oh. Animal Crossing, just Google it. It's all over the place. Um, it's on Nintendo Switch. It's a huge, huge kind of Zen-like game where you wander around collecting twigs and selling turnips and things. But and which sounds ridiculous, but one of the things that that's that's emerged now is that there's a a little guy who turns up every couple of weeks on a boat to sell you some a, a work of art, and your job is to out of the four works of art that he's got, which some of them are some of them are sculptures, some of them are paintings. There's usually three of them are fake, and you buy if you buy it and then try and take it to the gallery, then they'll say sorry, it's fake, we can't put it up. But if you get it right, you start populating your gallery. And so they've taken, you look at things and we've now start, we've all, well, we've got three switches in the house, four, four of us play this game. We've now hmm. taken to when the art comes up, uh, getting Google image search and pressing it because the art, even the fake ones look close enough to the original that it will find the original art piece. <laughs> and there's pieces of, there's pictures that, you know, you think, well, that doesn't look right, but I have no idea. And then you see it. Hmm. All oh, right, yes, that's the one. And there's there's famous ones like the girl with the pearl earring, but then there's 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 ones that I've not seen before, and it's got me to look at some art, and it's got my kids to look mm -hmm. at some art, and want to collect that art and get the right stuff in our museum that we wander around and then have a look at. It's mm -hmm. utterly brilliant. It's beautiful. That's very interesting. Oh, that yeah. pretty, that pretty good. It's a bit like actually there's a trend on Facebook at the moment, probably it's coming out of Instagram, I suspect, of people restaging famous paintings oh, yeah. with things mm. that are available to them in their house, you know. Mm. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, usually toilet rolls, yes. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's the engagement, I, absolutely, and it pulls pulls you in and makes makes you want to see see the originals as well. I think that's yeah. that's, that's better. Yeah. I often uh, restage the screen, but uh, not deliberately. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got another question. I've got another question come in here. Um, businesses are falling over themselves to use Zoom and Teams and all that sort of thing. Mm. How can we make these meetings more engaging, useful, and healthy? <laughs> we know the basics of running it now, don't we? Uh, Matt, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I think um, I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, you know, one thing I found personally, my my work involves a hell of a lot of travel to speak at conferences and, and meet people um, all over the place. And um, initially I thought, oh, well, it might not be, you know, such a such a bad silver lining to this horrible situation if um, I can get a break from, from all that travel. Yeah. But one thing that I found was that actually not having that kind of buffer space between those meetings that would normally be necessitated by quite a pleasant train journey with a cup mm. of tea and some nice views out the window um, mean, meant that, um, yeah, that I was finding it much more fatiguing to, 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 to do it, even without the kind of physical element of travel. So I think, you know, partly it's about um, spacing those meetings out so that the people turning up to attend them actually have the, the sort of brain power left over to mm. meaningfully engage with, with what's going on. I think we should tackle mm. head on as well the fact that it, d it does just take more cognitive resources to engage through a video call than it, than it does in person. It's kind yeah. of weird because there's, there's less information, but I think the, the brain must work harder to fill in the gaps when the, in the absence of that information, and um, that can be quite tiring. So really thinking about mm. does it need to be a meeting at all? If it does, can we can we keep it short? I found some pretty good results using tools like uh, Miro um, and Mural, uh, which um, allow you to kind of collaborate with colleagues on a big virtual whiteboard or, or kind of post-it Kanban board. And actually not having to kind of, um, you can use video with them, but not necessarily having to use video and just being able to look mm. collectively all at the same whiteboard and lay out our thoughts. I found that um, a lot more productive actually than sitting staring at a grid, uh, a grid full of people's faces. Yeah. Okay. I would say that there's, some, there's, there's an interesting twist as well that um, whereas initially everyone was being very serious about about the video and staring at it and feeling that you couldn't just go over here and take a drink because you were, you were somehow breaking the social contract 
Mm, People are kind mm. of getting around that and getting over that because you have to. You can't just stare. Yeah. But also, because all the tools are, are now providing slightly more quirky things, not just image background blur, but image background replacement with things mm -hmm. that people can then put their own pictures in. Yeah. There's lots more creativity in that and people willing to experiment with stuff that you might not think is serious. Definitely. But yet they do it for a business meeting yeah. again to try and help mm -hmm. with identity or to help people remember where the things were. And and I noticed generally it started with those of us that have been always messing around with this stuff anyway, <laughs> the kind of virtual world crew, we, we just yearn being able to change those things. But there's there's a particularly useful little tool that um, Snapchat now has a, a soft camera for the, for the PC. And if you take that, you place that in front of, as your webcam, so you direct your webcam at it, and then it does whatever work it needs to do with a Snapchat filter, and then feeds it to any of the, um, applications so like we've, we've got game to meeting here and so mm. that has enabled that that enabled me to turn up as a meeting in a full predator costume <laughs> replacing me which none of these things do because all these things are only doing backgrounds but there's a snapchat filter for predator you see i've got i mean i'm, I'm e predator online i've got a predator mask up there so it, it's a it's a thing and and it wasn't a serious business meeting but it was a business meeting mm -hmm. and that got that triggered a few sort of is this right? Should you do this? How should you dress? Should you do those sorts of things? Should you wear funny hats and stuff like that? And but but it's it's enough to make occasionally, like at the end of a meeting, just to have a lark around and do something, or, or while you're waiting for everyone to turn up, you go, look at this stupid filter I've found, or yeah. just turning the same filter and all looking like John Wick or something like that. It's it's opening up people's willingness to mess around with that stuff because otherwise it's so grinding. And what I would love to see is one of these video platforms just accidentally put a button in that you press and it just breaks this flat screen and drops us into a 3D environment with some 3D avatars or something. Just just so people go, oh, that's better at the point that they're, yeah, yeah. they're already fatigued. That's interesting. I, I um, You're a bit more creative than me, obviously, because what I tend to do, uh, Ian, uh, is this. I just show people little fossils from my... Uh, oh, that's awesome. Great. Yeah, that's animal it's, crossing it's, again. Animal Crossing, you collect it's, fossils as well for the for the museum. It, this is a spinal, uh, uh, it's a spinal um, disc from a an ichthyosaur, I'm told. Wow! Which we found at Lyme, wow. Lyme Regis. That's cool, mm. isn't it? That's the sort of thing I do. Awesome. I don't use backgrounds much. <laughs> anyway, that's amazing. Um, Max. That, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, um, usually, uh, chaps, we make these about 40, 45 minutes. We're coming up to that point now. You've made some lovely points, very interesting conversation. Thank you. I'm going to just leap on you the question I did warn you about, which is can you give us two, three, four, five, however many you want, interesting things to do in each of your little areas now? So, um, uh, the arts, gaming, and in, in sort of uh, social change and, and, and helping people. So, uh, Nick, can I start with you? Give us, give okay. us a few top tips, some stuff to look out for that's cool. Right, okay. Well, one thing I came across, it's a, it's a place I have actually been to physically, but I've, uh, it's, it's a long time ago. Uh, the Guggenheim um, Museum in, in, in New York is actually holding uh, virtual tours, but they're virtual live guided tours. You have to be there sort of present. So it's uh, it'll be today, funny enough, 12.30 um, American time, EST. So see, see what time that, that is in the, in the UK. It's probably about 6.30 p.m., I'm guessing. It's usually about a six hour time lag. So um, if you went to the, the, the Guggenheim site, guggenheim.org, and look for their virtual guided tours, that's one thing to do, because you're gonna get a guide actually take you through the space live. And I think that makes a big difference to you simply clicking on things mm. and moving through it. Um, interesting though that could be, I think actually j jumping, jumping on that is, uh, is, is really interesting. I certainly say uh, go to the Serpentine Gallery, look at their digital um, commissions. So you can see if you go to uh, their exhibitions page and then go to their online gallery there. Um, obviously, I would uh, boost the Computer Arts Society's talks on YouTube. So uh, go to our YouTube page, look up Computer Arts Society. You can see what we've been rabbiting on about for the last sort of six or eight weeks. Uh, loads of very interesting insights from all the artists who've been co collaborating with us. Um, and then, you know, I think also search out a couple of uh, interesting online tools as well. For instance, if you've got an Oculus, um, there's a Spanish graffiti artist called Felipe Pantone. And he's been doing things. There's a VR graffiti simulator called King Spray Graffiti, and he takes you through some of the things he's been doing. Now, um, 
I think you can do it maybe through the Oculus, but you can also, I think, if you haven't got one, see his work on, on YouTube and just sort of get into the things he's been doing. But it totally illustrates what Ian was saying about the ability to do things in that environment that you couldn't perhaps do physically. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of things I'm throwing out there. Oh, and by, by the way, I should um, also have a uh, just a quick plug for the Lumen Arts Prize as well. If you go to yes. lumenprize.com, you can see what this, this sort of new digital arts prize well, it has been going since 2011 but what it's been doing and that's had a lot of VR artists on it over the years we had a, in fact they won in 2016 so you've, you've, you've got that um, you know to, to go and explore you know, perhaps to help trigger your own creativity see what other people have been doing in the digital medium uh, for the last few years and, and what could be achieved anyway just a few that's thoughts brilliant. So. thank you <laughs> lovely that's, that's an excellent list Matt let's come to you what, what would you give us to be inspired with how can we help I think the main thing to think is that if you've been thinking as an IT professional of volunteering or just have that kind of nagging guilt that you feel like you could be doing more, there could not be a better time to do it. The, the world needs your skills now uh, more than ever. Um, there are so many charities out there looking to digitize their services, trying to figure out how to take um, online payments for, for donations, trying to find creative uses of technology to keep their uh, community groups or their arts groups going. So, you know, if, if you have those skills, obviously it's fantastic if you can uh, if you can volunteer with your uh, local food bank or, you know, uh, buy an item off a charity's Amazon wish list or, you know, any of those things that kind of anybody could do. Uh, but in particular, I would I would invite you to take a look around online um, connect with the charities that, that uh, have causes that are uh, uh, ones that you're passionate about. They don't have to be local anymore because you're not going to physically go there. Uh, they could even be in another country and um, offer up your skills in case they have any technical challenges because actually, you know, a few hours of a technologist's time could actually unblock something that charity that enables them to help thousands of people. Brilliant. Thank you. Ian? I would suggest that if you are a, a techie of any sort, you should have a go at building some game content. Okay whether it's whether it's exploring what you might be able to do with with kind of 3d and with graphics which you, you may not think you do because you're a programmer so you don't do graphics or if you maybe you uh, you understand a bit about visuals but you don't know what code is there's there's so many useful tools and resources whether it's building stuff with unity or with unreal engine 4 they're, they're just there they're, they're just do it and and experience what those are um i would also recommend uh, kind of engaging with esports in whatever way works for you as a okay. as a viewer sitting watching the formula one is fantastic you're watching pro drivers and celebrity drivers going around the very same track that you can then dive on on your console and drive around you can compare yourself to them or you can engage with some of the events and it doesn't just have to be driving because there's obviously been esports in in regular regular gaming for a long while but if you need a sports fix and you need competition or you need any of that just try and use the, the games industry for that and then get yourself in a virtual world just just think well what's the worst thing that can happen i mean it's mm. you you log on you go on you don't like it doesn't matter you not you don't have to pay loads of money to go to these things but you might just bump into somebody you have a conversation with somebody you've never met before and serendipity will take care of the rest great well, look, um, can I say, uh, Matt, Ian and Nick, that's been absolutely excellent. Excellent. We could have talked for a lot longer, but uh, we won't do that. But uh, thank you so much for appearing with us. Um, we will just, I'm just going to finish off by um, uh, just sharing my screen to show you the fact that uh, we have another one of these coming up next week. Let's uh, share my screen. I hope that's done that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the next slide will tell us that next week, or will it? Ah, there we go. <laughs> a very a, a change of pace next week. So we're looking at another one in, in the health area. There's been a lot of innovation there of late, of necessity. Uh, what will happen to that once once the peak is is um, has started coming down? Well, that started happening, hasn't it? But uh, we've got some interesting uh, speakers from uh, various areas of the NHS. So uh, Ian, Nick, Matt, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, listeners, yeah. as well. And uh, that brings our uh, broadcast to an end. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. All the very best. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.